number four this morning. Appreciate God's Word. Amen. And appreciate uh, the Calvary and the cross. And uh, I, I said in Sunday school, you be careful about a preacher that never wants to talk about the cross, never wants to talk about what Jesus done, never talk about the resurrection. You be careful of that, man. And uh, we ought to magnify what God magnifies. And there's one theme of this Bible, and it is the redemption of man by the loving grace of God. And I'm grateful for that. We're in John 4. We preached out of last Sunday morning out of verses 1 through 18. I'll give you a brief review if you've got an outline. It's in there. But we talked about the reputation of Christ in verse 1 and 2, how word was getting around that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples. Now, John had disciples, but he didn't make any of them. <laughs> Jesus made them, amen. And then the, the, the route, verse 3 and 4, he left Judea and departed into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. We've been centering our thoughts around that little verse, he must needs go. And I'm preaching this morning on when the Savior stopped by Samaria. I'm glad for that day when he stopped by my way. I'm glad when he stopped by your way. And last Sunday morning we talked about, in verse 6, the described well, how Jacob's well uh, was there and how that well is a picture of the church. And then we talked about the defiled woman that came to that well. And we made the point that the well did not save that woman. But it did create an opportunity for Jesus to save that woman. And by the way, the church can't save anybody, but the church is a good place to point people to Jesus. And we talked about her sinfulness, and we talked about uh, her inquiring and, and the insult. And, and, and then we talked about uh, the divine water in verse 12 and 14, how it was supplied water and satisfying water and springing water. And then we closed out in verses 15 through 18 with the desperate want. She said, I, I want this water. Give me this water. And Jesus messes up the whole thing. I say that tongue in cheek. He looked at her and said, go call your husband. What is he doing? He's making her face her sin. He is making her realize that she is guilty uh, before God. And so that's what we're going to pick up. And, and we're going to read the verses as I preach the text. Instead of me reading the verses, I'm just going to preach through them. We're going to read them as we go. Is that all right this morning? And so we're talking about when the Savior stopped by Samaria. And so now what we're going to pick up in verse 19. She looks in verse 18 and 19. Jesus said, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thine husband in that thou said is truly Jesus said call your husband she said I have no husband he said you said right you've got five husbands and the one you're with now is not your husband watch what she said in verse 19 the woman saith unto him sir I perceive thou art a prophet so she begins to get religious now so notice first of all this morning we find the details of worship verses 19 through 24 watch what she says verse let's read the verses and we'll preach through them verse 20 our fathers worship in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seek as such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. This little area of scripture, she begins to act religious. I notice first of all, the deception of worship. Verses 19 through 22, she, she was deceived about what true worship was. She said, our fathers worship in this mountain. You'll recall last Sunday morning we dealt with, dealt with this, and I'll mention it again, that the Samaritans and the Jews had no dealings with one another. I, I told Brother Phil to zoom in on me. Here I am walking around. Amen. I'll do better, Phil. I'm sorry. I, I need to get him a joystick back here like on Galaga. Amen. But then he'd be playing Galaga back there. But, uh, but and, and the Jews and the Samaritans, uh, they had no dealings. There was a lot of controversy between Samaria and Jerusalem. The Samaritans felt like that the temple should have been built in the mountain that she is speaking of, but God did not want it built there. And so this woman she's acting religious because she puts her eternal soul in the context of a place she thinks she's saved because of where she goes 
She thinks that she is right with God because of her address and not because of the alignment and the attitude of her heart. And there's a lot of people that still have that mentality. They think uh, because they go to church, they think because uh, their name is on a church roll uh, that they're saved. But I said it last Sunday and I want to say it again. Uh, me standing in a garage does not make me a car. No more than you come to church makes you a Christian. Amen. You have to be born again. Uh, you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not having your name on a church roll. Uh, that's not being dunked in the baptistry. I'm talking about that's coming to a point where you desire to have a personal relationship with Jesus. She's deceived about that. Jesus looks at her in verse 21. He says, I'm going to tell you right now, there's coming a time when there ain't nobody going to be worshiping this mountain nor in Jerusalem. What Jesus is talking about is in 70 AD when the emperor Titus would come in and destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple of which you still see the ruins today in Israel. He's, he's saying there's coming a time when worship ain't going to be about the temple. Worship is not about a place. Worship is about a person. There's a lot of people, they worship the building. I thank God for a nice building, and I praise God for that. But, you know, if we, God forbid, if the church burned down, we could still meet out of here under a pine tree somewhere, and the church would still meet. That's what Jesus is telling this woman. He's saying, it's not about the place that you're in. It's not about this particular mountain. It's about the person of worship. She is deceived about worship. Not only the deception, but look at verse 23. Notice the desire for worship. But the hour cometh, and now is... When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Now I'm not I, I'm not trying to be uh, smarter anything this morning, but that word true, if there is such a thing as a true worshiper, then that must mean there are false worshipers, and false worship is idolatry. There's formal worship. That's trying to be impressive. There's fleshly worship. That's all about the individual. But God desires faithful worship, which is inspired and focused on one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the singing today. I hope you enjoyed the choir. I hope you enjoy. I hope you uh, get something out of the preaching. But it's not about the choir, and it's not about the singers, and it's certainly not about this preacher, but it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not worthy to be worshipped this morning. And I got news for you, neither are you. That's why our sign says, and, and we're just going to adopt it as our motto around here, our job is to make much of Jesus. Amen. Put that on the bulletin next Sunday. That's going to be our motto. Amen. Everything we're going to get from now on is going to say making much of Jesus. And that's what it's about around here. We're not making much of me. We're not making much of you. But we ought to lift up Jesus and make it all about him. Here's why. I, 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 I've not done for you what Jesus done for you. And you've not done done for me what Jesus has done for me. But, our, but Brother Tony sung the song this morning. He is the best thing that ever happened to us. And we ought to make it all about him today. Amen. Amen. So I said, well, I certainly ought to get it all emotional at church. You should have seen me at the ball game this week when they were walking my best hitter intentionally in a ball game. And my boy started chanting, let him hit, let him hit, amen. Somebody said, was you participating in that? I plead the fifth, all right. Uh, but I may have, and I may or may not have told my batters to get up on top of the plate and lean out, amen. If they're going to walk one of us, they're going to walk all of us. Somebody help me, all right. And we won Thursday night. They, we scored six runs in the first inning. It quit that business, all right. Uh, but, but I got, man, when Dax the other night hit the game-winning hit, and I'm coaching third base, I didn't say, Man, I went nuts. I about threw him over the. I about threw him on top of the dugout. I mean, it was you know we were cheered. If there had been some Gatorade, I'd have poured it on myself. All right, I got excited about it. Amen. I enjoyed that. But you know what? A ball and a bat that don't matter at the end of the day. That has no eternal value. But what Jesus has done for us, and what Calvary has done for us, and what the cross did for us, ought to be something that we we ought at least shed a tear over. We ought to at least have a heart of appreciation and gratitude, and thank God for what He's done. Notice that verse said, the Father seeketh such to worship him. It means God's looking for somebody that will worship him. I wonder if, if the Lord come by Safe Harbor today, would he find somebody that would worship him? Would he find such this morning? Would he, see, would he find that one that would worship him? Well, A.P. Gibbs, an old writer, said in the Old Testament, it was the worshiper who sought the Lord. But in this present church age, it is God the Father who seeks the worship of his children. 
There is the, there is the, uh, not the deception of worship. And there's not only uh, the desire for worship, but look at verse number 24. There is the demand of worship. The word worship, if you look it up in a Strong's Concordance, it means to kiss the hand in a token of reverence. It means to kneel, to pay homage or obeisance, to, expect, to express respect, to pay divine honors with reverence, and to adore. I thought that word adore probably summed it all up the best. To adore, to worship, to love him. And here's what God said. For Jesus said in verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, what is that? Well, God wants spiritual worship. In spirit, that means that, that the Holy Spirit leads that. That means only saved people can worship. Because only saved people have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. Now, the Bible said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. If you're breathing, you ought to praise the Lord. Even a lot, God's given a lost man breath. He ought to thank God for the breath he's given. Yeah. I was talking to a man the other day who, who I don't know his situation with the Lord, uh, but he expressed that. He said, every day I live, I wake up and I thank God for another day to live. What is that man doing? He may not realize it or not, but he's obeying Psalm 150, verse 6, that everyone that have breath, praise the Lord. But if he gets saved and the Spirit of God moves on the inside, he'll be able to love the Lord like God meant for him to. You see, the angels praise God, but they don't worship him like we do. Because worship is a love, it is an emotion that the angels do not understand or comprehend. There is, the, there is a demand of worship. It's spiritual worship, but then it's scriptural worship. God is a spirit, and they that worship must worship him in spirit and in truth. And it had that word must keeps popping up in this. I think Brother Richie might have preached here at the church on that, on them must. You must be born again. He must increase. We talked about last week, he must needs go. Here's another must in this text. We must worship him in spirit and truth. And so that truth is the Bible. So real worship will never go against this book. If you see somebody's doing something that doesn't line up with the Bible, then it ain't of God. Somebody said, what, what, what about people raising their hand? Well, the Bible said, lift your hands in the sanctuary. What about people saying amen? The Bible said, let all the people say amen. What about uh, people standing up? The Bible said, Nehemiah 8, that when Nehemiah got up to read the Bible, everybody stood and praised and worshiped the Lord. It needs to be what, real worship will never contradict or violate Scripture. So there's the details of worship. And we're just preaching this story. Look at verse 25 through 27. Number 2 there is the displayed wonder. So this woman, she wants to talk about worship. So Jesus talks about it with her. And what's the, what's the revelation, verse 25? The woman saith unto him, Well, I know the Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us all things. She's saying, Well, I, I, I agree, sir. She, now, she don't know who he is. She's saying, I, I agree. When he gets here, he's going to show us all things. That lets me know that she has a desire. That lets, I believe that is a stages of repentance right there. She is, she is turning and she's interested. She, she wants to know. She, she said, well, I know they say Messiah is coming. They say the Christ is coming. But look, look what he says in verse 26. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. She said, I'd really like to meet him. He said, you're in luck. <laughs> I know he didn't say that, but if he was from Rockwell, that's what he would have said. Yeah. Uh, she said, I really like to know him. He said, well, the one that's talking to you, I'm he. Yeah. I want to remind us all this morning. I know it's a Sunday morning crowd, but God ain't hiding from you. God ain't trying to hide himself from you, but he wants you to be saved. He wants you to know him. Here's this woman. Nobody wanted to be around her. That's why she's coming to this well at this time. Nobody wanted to be around her, but he wanted to show himself to her and let her know, I am the one that can change your life. And aren't you glad for the day when you realized who Jesus was and he revealed himself to you and you realize it's true. It's really true. The revelation. Hey, I wrote this down. Being honest with God will get positive results in your life. Because when she got honest and said, you know, he said, you've, not, you know, you, you've had five husbands. The one you're with now is not your husband. She said, I perceive you're a prophet. In other words, she said, you got me. When she got honest, God helped her. You know why a lot of people will never get help from God? Because they will not get honest. And they will not get humble. The Bible said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. The Bible speaks of us being honest. So there's the revelation. But then, verse 27, 
just to ruin the whole story, here comes the preachers to mess it up. There's the ridicule. Look at verse 27. And, it, and, 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 and upon this came his disciples. That little phrase, upon this, means as she, he is saying, I that speak unto thee am he, here comes the disciples. Now, we don't, these are not the twelve yet. He has not, and I know this is messing us up a little bit in our mindset. There are disciples of the Lord, but then he picks twelve out. Jesus, Jesus had 70 that he sent out. Out of 70, he had 12. So there's not necessarily 12 disciples in this verse. Could it be just a handful? And, and preaching through this chronologically in, in order in the life of Christ is let me see that. And I'm like, oh, okay, good to know. And so here comes the disciples. There's at least two, maybe three or four. Watch what they do in verse 27. They marvel that he taught with the, the woman. Here's what he's saying. Here's what they're meant. Why is he talking to her? Don't, don't, don't he know who she is? She's a Samaritan. We don't, we don't talk to people like that. We, we, we're not going to associate with people like that. They begin to ridicule the Lord. That's pretty bad when you're picking on Jesus. And they want, I don't think they said it out loud because the Bible said they marveled that he talked with the woman. I think, and, but the Bible said, yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? They knew better than that. <laughs> they knew better to say, why are you talking to her? They just thought it. Uh, they, they, so they wasn't completely dumb because they knew, better not say nothing about it, but why is she doing that? By the way, why would God even deal with any of us? If you knew me like I knew me, you wouldn't want to hear me preach. But Jack, if I knew you like, like you know you, I wouldn't want to preach to you either. So it's good. It's all under the blood if you're saved and under Calvary, amen. And they ridiculed her. Jesus was not concerned with their opposition or their opinions. He simply took the opportunity to deal with this woman. Number three, verses 28 through 30, there is the diligent witness. Now, and we got we to stay in the story. Like that old Georgia commentator, he'd say, get the picture now. And he, he called radio games. Old Larry Munson, he's dead now. He'd always say, get the picture. George's in red helmets, red shirts, silver pants, Tennessee's in that ugly orange. I mean, he would just always say, so get the picture now. Here, here's, here's Jesus. He's talking to this woman. The disciples walked, he said, he that's speaking to thee, I'm he. I'm the, I'm the Savior. I'm the Messiah. She hears that. Disciples walk up here and that. Now, watch what happens in verse 27. Notice her excitement. The woman then left her water pot and went the way into the city. Went the way into the city. So, he says, the one that's speaking to thee, I'm he. He don't say anything else. She leaves her water pot and runs away. <laughs> you imagine what the disciples saw? Here they walk up. Why are they talking to her and where is she going? She just, you know why she left? She's excited. She had just met Jesus. She was excited about it. In fact, she got so excited, she left the water pot. Amen. Like I, 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 she, she, like I did the other night at the ball game. I got so excited we won, I left my Georgia Turvis that William bought me at the ball game. Amen. Had somebody, had somebody get it. Got so excited, she left. But watch this now. That water pot was her livelihood. That water pot was what she's expecting to bring her hope and peace and joy. But now she don't need that anymore. Because she went with a water pot, but she left with the well. Amen. She went looking for a little. But she left with a lot. She went looking for something to get her through that day. <laughs> but she left with something that would get her through eternity. She went looking for something small, but she left with something significant. She went for looking for something temporal, but she left with something eternal. I ain't got this written down. I wish I had. That's good. Amen. Amen. You remember when you got saved, you were just looking uh, to get out of hell and to get your sins forgiven. But you left with a, you were looking for a little, but we left with a lot. We found so much more than we ever expected. In fact, we found exceeding, abundantly, abundantly. Above all we could ask or even think, thank God. And she was excited about it. She was happy about it. She was actually doing what I wish some of y'all would do. She was smiling. <laughs> Amen. There's nothing wrong with, with having joy. Not only her excitement. Notice her expression, verse 29. Said to the men, come see a man which told me all things ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Evidence of her conversion. Listen, now, you know how I know she got saved? She wanted to tell somebody. Her excitement, verse 28. Her expression, verse 29. Now watch this now. Brother Richie, she didn't have all the theological ins and outs of justification and imputation and, 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 and all that. She didn't have that, all that. and she didn't, she didn't have a Roman's road yet. Not being, she didn't have all that. 
What are you talking about? She said, you just got to come see. <laughs> you just got to come see a man. I, I mean, I imagine. I, I, sorry, Phil, I'll be back in a minute. I, I imagine she's, she's like this. She's like this. I don't know how she, you, you got to come. You got to come. You got to come see this man. You got to come. You got to come see this man who told me everything I ever did. Hey, I'm telling you, that's what we ought to be this morning. We tell, I ain't saying go grab somebody and drag them to church. That might get you arrested, okay? But what I am saying is you ought to have some excitement and you ought to have a burden to want to tell somebody else what Jesus has done for you. Her exp- then notice the effectiveness. Verse number 30. And they went out of the city and came unto him. They actually responded to her invitation. And she said, would you come see him? And they said, okay. If it means that much to you, if you have that much, if he's done that much for you, come see him. Man, the greatest witness is someone who knows what Jesus has done for them. Where I preached that this past Wednesday, this church had been in a, uh, in, in a uh, not a, not an every night revival, but in a good spirit of revival. And I was talking to the, I'd never been there before. I met the pastor years ago, and we got reacquainted Wednesday. And he called me a week before and said, hey, uh, we need to have a meeting. I'm going to have Brother Bobby Stewart Monday and Tuesday. He can't come Wednesday. He's already got a prior appointment. Can you come Wednesday and finish that? I said, yes, sir. I, I went there not knowing anything and got there uh, Wednesday night. And, I mean, 375 people packed in on a Wednesday night. I mean, uh, I mean the, the church was filled. And uh, I asked the pastor, I said, what's going on? He said, well, I preached a message on the importance of giving you testimony. And he said, I've done that on a, either a Sunday morning or a Sunday night. And the next service, he said, the choir got done singing, and somebody walked up and said, Preacher, I need to give my testimony. And, and his premise was, if you won't give your testimony in the church, then you're not going to give it in the world. And so he's trying to help his people to get over their shot. He said, but this broke out in revival. He said, we've had people getting saved. And, and we, was there, we was there Wednesday night. And the pastor said, I want you to sit on the platform. He said, because I must may put you up at any time. I said, that's fine. And so the choir sang and everything. And all of a sudden, four or five people walked up doing this number. <laughs> that's always a good sign. And then it's a blessing when you get, you get them up there and they get to crying. You don't know what they're saying, but you like what they're saying. I didn't understand every word they said, but I knew everything they meant. I mean, when he goes, Jesus saved me. I'm like, yeah, I got all that. I got it. I like it. Yeah. What are they doing? They want to tell somebody else. Yeah. Y'all not be afraid to tell somebody what Jesus has done for you. But you know why a lot of people won't tell somebody? Because Jesus ain't never done nothing for them. And that ain't his fault. Right. Right. Amen. Number four. We're moving on in the story. The devotion to the work. I love I loved just going through these verses. I love this. I love It's a good book. Ain't it? It's a great book. I like it. Now, the text turns from the lady back to the disciples. Look at verse 31. Notice the petition. In the meanwhile, while all these men are coming to Jesus to come and see, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat, which is on everybody's mind right now. <laughs> Preacher, let's go eat. This woman has just been saved and a revival is breaking out in Samaria and all they're concerned about is their flesh. Boy, that happens a lot. That happens a lot. We get, we get so focused on the temporal things that we miss what God's doing in the eternal matters. The proclamation, look at verse number 32. But he said unto them, I have meat that you know not of. <laughs> he said, uh, Jesus let them know he wasn't concerned with feeding his flesh. He was concerned with the spiritual. Notice the disciples pondering. Verse 33, I know I'm running through this, but I'm hungry. Therefore, said, I'd probably be one of these disciples saying, Master, let's go to Chick-fil-A, you know. Verse 33, therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him to eat? Ought to eat? <laughs> Who got him food before we, we went to the city? Because early in the chapter, they went to buy meat. And now they're saying, Don't tell me somebody's done brought him a sandwich before we got here. And, and they just didn't get it. So Jesus has to show him, verse, verse 34 through 38, his passion. Look what Jesus said to them in verse 34. Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That word meat, he said, what I'm feeding on. You know why we eat? Because our body needs it. It's what keeps us going. He said, what keeps me going. I understand he is the Messiah. I understand he's the Son of God. But he made a lesson to these disciples. What keeps me going is I want to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. Say ye not, verse 35, there are yet four months and come at the harvest. Bold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He said, don't wait and say, well, we'll get it later. He said, no, the, the, the fields are ready now. Verse 36, and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit in the life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap. 
that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye entered into their labors. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, look, I have sent you out into these fields to reap. You didn't have to sow. What are you talking about? He's talking about those men that are coming. Jesus, I need some, here's what he's basically saying. I need some help with, you, with these guys. I, I need you to quit being focused on the temporal about eating. We can eat later. There are souls coming. And if we're not careful sometimes, we'll just think, well, Jesus is going to take care of it all. Well, Jesus will, but he uses you and I yes, to, pass out, to pass out a gospel tract, to speak to somebody about the Lord. Uh, well, I don't want to give it. You can't give a gospel tract to the wrong person. You can't tell the wrong person about Jesus. Jesus was more focused on the eternal than the temporal. The sad reality of this text, though, is this woman who had been saved less than five minutes has brought more people to Jesus than these disciples have. They brought him a sandwich and she brought him souls. Have you ever brought anybody to Jesus? I didn't say you hadn't necessarily take your Bible and lead them, but did you ever, have you ever tried to get somebody here under the truth or, so, or somewhere where the gospel's being preached? I'm not necessarily saying it has to be these four walls. But if you try to be a light and a testimony, you may be the one that Paul said that planted. Or you might be a polis that watered. But God always gives the increase, 1 Corinthians 3. We are laborers together with God. Here's the last thing, verses 39 through 44. There's the desired word. See, I'm not being critical of being a preacher. I know it's a lot. But most, people, most guys take that text and break it apart from the woman at the well. But that's what he's talking about. He's saying, look, these fields, I believe these men are coming. They're white in the harvest. They're ready. Don't Don't wait. Let's go get them now. So the desired words, verse 39, there's the converts. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. Men got saved because this woman gave her testimony. The continuation, verse 40. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. You know what they said? Would you stay? We want to know more. We want to learn more. Sounds like those people that got saved in the book of Acts, they continued in the apostles' doctrines and prayers. Have you given anybody your testimony? Well, preacher, it's not big and grand. I didn't say it was big and grand. I'm talking about we were all in darkness. We were all headed for hell. And if you got saved, you're now in the light. You've been resurrected. Have you told anybody about that? Well, Preacher, ain't nobody going to ain't, ain't, ain't nothing going to happen if I tell my story or tell my testimony. You'd be surprised. This one woman got the got a revival broke out in Samaria because this woman gave her testimony. Now notice the cause of it though. Verse number three, verse forty-one and forty-two. I'm done. And many more believed because of his own word. Some got saved because they heard her words about him, but many more believed because they heard him. And they said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. And we know that indeed this, uh, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now watch this now. Don't miss this. I'm done. It was not enough for them to have the faith of that woman. Because here's what they said. Now we believe, not because of thy saying, but because we have now heard him. There's a lot of people that have secondhand salvation. Now, secondhand salvation is not a thing, but I'm using that to make a point. They want to ride on everybody else's spirituality and think because their mama's going to heaven, their daddy's going to heaven, their family's saved, they're okay. And here's what those men said. We believe not because of what you said, but we, we, we've met him. We've heard him. And ain't it amazing? Jesus was t- weary from his journey. And he stops by a well in Samaria where nobody... And at the outset of the story, it looks like he's just after one. But we know God sees in from the beginning. He started with one, Brother Tony, and he reached a city. See, there's a power in what God can do with one person. When she got honest with God, God done something in her life. Aren't you glad for the day he stopped by your Samaria? He must needs go through Samaria. Can I make it practical? He must needs stop by that second pew. He must need stop by that third pew. He must need stop by that pew you were sitting on or that place you was at when you got saved. He must needs go and he stopped by where you is at. And you've never been the same. Thank God for his amazing grace. As we stand this morning, I appreciate your attention. When the Savior